Kentwood. Episode 8. The Unconventional Kentwood by Jacob Thompson. Professor Kentwood was, by coincidence or design, usually far from campus during spring break. It is a time of year that I have long associated less with beaches and fleeting nudity than with parking nightmares and strange costumes. During the second week of spring break, the Future Frontiers Science Fiction Convention descends upon campus. Tonight's adventure occurred during the year in which Kentwood was present to witness the madness in person. Daniel, are you on campus at present? Yes, I am working on some lectures. There is a group of people making me ill at ease. People in strange costumes afoot. They are reminiscent of an exceptionally frail mob of sporting fanatics or carnies with advanced degrees. It is only the ninth annual science fiction convention. You must have somehow missed the first eight. I perceive nothing scientific in chainmail clad vagrants battering each other with patent weapons, and I only wish they were fictional. It's called live action role playing. I call them doomed should they continue to loiter on my property. You must concede that no one made you put your mansion on campus. So, following the good professor's orders, I walked across campus and delivered the message I was given. Stop, stranger! The king demands tribute! Well, Professor Eldridge Kentwood has told me to tell you that this is his property and that he will not tolerate the presence of an ersatz medieval Donnybrook on his lawn. Well then, vassal of Kentwood! Prepare to drink the same foul brew that shall befall your chief should he dare show his face. Charge! Oh no! Don't hit me with your padded swords. I assure you that these inflict pain, good sir. Lestwise, we would not don yonder chainmail, which be expensive as dragon You're being silly now. So honor is silly! Ow! I'll sue you if you take off your mask and reveal your identity. Ah, a building to hide in! Sanctuary, sanctuary! I escaped into a building where the convention was in progress and ducked into the nearest room. It was a small classroom with a sign hanging from the door that advertised, The Beast Within? Animals in Science Fiction and Fantasy, 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. Miss Lawler, exactly what movies have you put your animals in, and in perhaps a disconnected tangent, do you think that animal species are often typecast? Snakes, for example, symbolize evil. And, as we all know... Oh, Snakes are icky. I put animals, but not snakes, in Beverly Hills Chihuahua, and also Top Dog with Chuck Norris... And by the way, Ben Zabago just showed up, and he totally sucks, so don't look at him. And he'd be a better panelist than you. He wouldn't have interrupted my question about parcel tongue. You want entertainment, dude? Other dude, the one closest to me, can you be a deer and unscrew my right leg? It's not real, and it's barely attached anyway. Not wanting to be hit by an artificial leg, which I assumed would be quite painful, I peeped outside to see if my nemesis the knight was still waiting. He was not only there, but he'd brought some armor-clad friends. I was stuck listening to the leg slowly unspool over the murmur of tedious questions. Do you believe that the post-World War II urbanization of the United States affected how animals were portrayed in popular culture? Not as far as I can tell. That was for the smart panelists. Whatever. I just want to say that my leg is almost off. I'll give a hundred dollars to the first person who uses it to smash Dr. Zabargo. If those knights kill me, I want you to feel guilty for the rest of your life. Halt, meddler! My party shall gain ten experience points for giving you bashing damage! No! Don't! 
Wait now. All of you are wearing heavy armor. And, and Layla's hopping around on one leg. I can outrun all of you easily. Not as easy as you think, villain! Aha! I escaped with a few glancing blows and made it to the Kentwood mansion and reported that Layla Lawler, one of his old enemies, was on campus. Ah, of my many enemies, Miss Lawler is perhaps the most determined and definitely the most unipodal. Technically, she walks on two legs. It's just that one of them is artificial. However many legs she walks upon, she brings danger wherever she treads. Allow me to employ my deductive skills to concoct a master plan. Professor Kentwood? I have deducted a master plan. Working under the assumption that our enemies have an addiction to melodrama, we shall attend the masquerade ball in person. As I feel there is reason to suspect the life of University President Grackle is in danger, I shall arrange that he not be present at the masquerade ball that he is scheduled to judge. Where should I start? Go to that large temporary emporium in the basement of the student union. You mean the dealer's room? Consider it done. I entered the overcrowded throng that was the dealer's room, a vast and colorful warehouse of science fiction nonsense. Among the cards and bootleg movie stands, I found a place to get costumes. You look lost. Perhaps I am. I need two costumes. I have lots of costumes, but I need to know what you want. I want something as cheap as possible for myself, because I'm not being reimbursed. And whatever costume looks most like this guy. This is a picture of the president of the university, and I want someone to look like him. It's okay. I'm just a businessman, and you can keep your secrets to yourself. The cheapest thing I got is a Rubik the Amazing Cube costume that fell off a truck into a river. It don't look much like a Rubik anymore, and it's yours for free. The price is right. For the other one, I'll give you this costume of Jamie from Mythbusters. It's a bargain of ten bucks. It's a mustache, a pair of glasses, a skull cap, and a beret. I feel this is less a coherent costume than an assemblage of costume elements. Take it or leave it. Okay. From there, it was off to the masquerade ball. Professor Kentwood assured me that he had a better costume than any of those thieving reprobates in the dealer's room could provide him. I was curious about both Professor Kentwood's costume and his plan. My, my, my. I see a sexy Starbuck, a beautiful Buffy, and, uh... Xenophobic Xena. Sorry, Xena. I couldn't think of another word that started with X. Oh. My. God. This cube looks familiar. Rubik, you suck. Both as a costume and as a person? Who are you to judge this costume? Captain Hook, after all, has a hook on his hand, not on his foot. Wait, you're Layla! Yo, Slowpoke, you've got company. Huzzah! My quest for first place costume glory brings me a chance to complete my revenge on my foe! My only problem was that you were on Professor Kentwood's lawn. You had best spend willpower to temporarily gain hit points! I can't help but believe that this is an overreaction. The problem has been long resolved. Taste defeat! Upon completion of my mission, I now accept my experience points and rejoin my party at the hentai room! Huzzah! Daniel! What, Professor Kentwood? My hook got stuck in his costume when I tried to kick him in the kneecap, and now it's stuck on his costume. Duh! I come in the guise of Odin, Allfather, Oathbreaker, and Lord of the Slain. But I, Eldridge Kentwood, am in fact all that and more! How dare you assume you could incapacitate me with a single kick to the knee? I'll kill you later, but just cut me loose so I can hit the dance floor and boogie down and not have to listen to you. Fenrir, my faithful hellhound, bite this artificial leg in twain and release me! They let you bring Alpha in here? Alpha let Alpha in here. Alpha, strike! Alpha just bit that leg in half! Thank you, Mr. Narrator. Now, I don't know how I can get my dance on. I wish the student gave me my leg back. Why is Alpha freaking out? 
My hound has been trained to recognize the scent of my enemies. The room is packed with them. President Grackle is in danger from innumerable foes, many of whom are bellying up to the bar and lurching around on the dance floor. Well, if it isn't struggling character actor Martin Vesey, former star of Attack of the Space Confederates, what's on your mind? You've managed this school so badly that when my acting career hit the skids, I had nothing to fall back on. People say a degree from this school is about as good as a diploma from a troubled inner-city high school. For contributing to my unemployment, you must die. I'm not being paid enough to get stabbed. Help me, scantily clad women! I want all prospective assassins to know that my bloodthirsty dog considers this first attack to be mere practice. At the masquerade ball in Valhalla, Fenrir will come disguised as Alpha! Who the hell are you? You really don't want to know, dude. Silence, Pitmonger! Damn straight! Don't let your guard down in this room of lost souls. After we walked out of the room, the masquerade ball calmed down enough to award winners. The prizes were given to C-3PO, Mojo Jojo, and Fenrir. I believe that Alpha is still the only dog ever to receive any prize at the Future Frontiers convention. As soon as I could, I asked Professor Kentwood to clarify some matters. Even you understand that there are a multitude of threats to President Grackle's dissolute life this evening. Thus, I hired one of the many struggling actors at this event to impersonate him at the ball. What did you do with the real Grackle? He is now downstairs. Filking. I don't know what that is, but knowing Grackle, it must be disgusting. Disgusting it is, but not in the manner that you expect. Have a look. And they call him Bilbo. Bilbo Baggins, the bravest little hobbit of them all. Damn. Inspired by the success of that performance, President Grackle bought some studio time and dropped an album within a year. It didn't fare very well with critics, or the public, but copies can occasionally be found in area yard sales. The Future Frontiers convention is still an annual event, and veterans of the event are said to nostalgically recall Alpha's antics at the masquerade and bemoan the tameness of recent events. I'll get back to you in subsequent episodes of Kentwood.